Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our presentation titled Detection and Treatment Prediction of Pancreatic Cancer Using a Glycan Biomarker. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Brian Hobb. Dr. Hobb is a professor in the Center for Cell Biology at the Van Andel Institute in Grand Rapids, Michigan. His research is on the identification and detection of subtypes of pancreatic cancer using glycan biomarkers. The laboratory studies blood plasma, tumor tissue, and cyst fluid using the novel glycan analysis technologies to deliver biomarkers for early and more accurate diagnosis and improved prediction of tumor behavior and drug responses. For complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. If you have any questions that arise during the presentation, we encourage you to submit them in the Q&A box. Our speaker will address your questions following the presentation. Please join me now in welcoming Dr. Brian Hobb. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much for the introduction and the opportunity to present our work before you today. Appreciate participating in this interesting symposium. Uh, it's my pleasure to tell you about some work we've done on a new biomarker that looks like it has a lot of promise for the detection and treatment prediction of pancreatic cancer. I'm going to begin by telling you a bit of background on the biomarker, how we discovered it. Uh, first of all, disclosure, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, I'm going to give you a uh, overview on how we discovered this biomarker and some of the work we've done on it on initial validation and um, tell you about the foreseen clinical applications in pancreatic cancer and uh, give you an overview of the results to date and validation of the biomarker. Um, to begin, this is a glycan, so it's it's a um, an oligosaccharide. We've named it STRA for silylated tumor-related antigen, and we discovered it with the hypothesis that uh, there are glycans that are related to the CA99 glycan that could also be biomarkers of pancreatic cancer. So CA99 is the current best test for pancreatic cancer, it's up in some other cancers as well. It's made in the normal pancreas in some individuals. It is a quatrosaccharide, so it's made of four monosaccharides. Uh, there are a number of people who do not elevate it in cancer for whatever reason, some because they don't genetically make it, others because they have a subtype of pancreatic cancer that doesn't produce the CA99 glycan. Oh. Overall, when a test is used at about a 25% false positive rate amongst benign diseases, it uh, picks up about 75% of the cancers in the blood, so that translates to a 75% specificity and sensitivity on average over many studies now. Uh, the antibody that detects this glycan, that's called the CA199 antibody, that's why it's named that, uh, was discovered in 1979 when the antibody was originally generated, it wasn't known what it bound. And it was through some more research over the next few years, it was discovered to be a uh, oligosaccharide. And then the structure of it was found to be uh, the structure that you see on this slide here um, as a member of the what's called the Lewis uh, blood group family of um, glycans. So we realized that if there are any modifications to this structure changes, that the antibody would no longer bind. So the hypothesis was that there are other glycans related to it that are not bound by the CN10 antibody, but are produced by pancreatic cancers. So if we uh, had ability to detect these fam other family members, we might be able to detect more pancreatic cancers. So we undertook a survey of uh, related structures to the CNH9. We used glycan profiling on chip. This was uh, about four years ago, four or five years ago, we began this work. Um, it's, it's a combination of using capture antibodies on antibody microarrays combined with various detection reagents that detect uh, glycans in the Lewis family. 
And uh, it's nice because you can detect a lot of combinations of antibody and detection lectins um, over many blood samples or tissue samples. So it's a, it's a nice, highly parallel and high throughput method. Uh, so screening through a, a, a number of different potential glycans to, that could be biomarkers, um, we came up with some good candidates. And this is a summary slide here from our 2016 publication where we have um, the patients in the columns and the various potential biomarkers in the rows. And a red box means the, these are blood samples. A red box means the level was above a high specificity threshold set for that row uh, at one false positive. So you see on the right side are the controls and there's one red box in each row. So uh, the threshold was set to give high specificity, low false positives. And um, you can see here that the top row, uh, SLEA is the technical term for the antigen bound by CA199. So the top row is CA199. And you can see at this high specificity, there's a fairly low sensitivity. There's a lot of yellows, meaning there's a lot of patients who are not elevated in it. Um, but what you can notice here is that for the patients, many of the patients that are not elevated in CN99, they are elevated um, in some of these other rows. And these are other glycans in that family member, uh, family, the Lewis family. And we focus in particular on one that um, was related to CN99 in that it um, did not have a fucose like CN99 but yet it was built off the type one chain. We give a technical abbreviation for it here. Um, and, and you can see that it, it picks up both in uh, early stage cancer, which we define as stage one or two, which is resectable cancer. Um, and late in both of those, it picks up a lot of the ones that are not detected by CA199. Uh, so more information on the structure. Here's the, um, both the three-dimensional uh, representations as well as the um, symbolic cartoon graphs of the antigens themselves, CA199 and STRA. Uh, so again, you can appreciate that they're built off the same core structure, the beta-3 linkage between the galactose and the N-acetylglucosamine um, defines what's called a type 1 um, and acetolactosamine linkage, which is less common than the type two, which is the beta four linkage. Um, and it's missing the fucose. And it's interesting that this antigen without the sialic acid is um, widely known to be a marker for um, germ cells, so embryonic stem cells and um, tumors arising out of um, embryonic uh, germline tumors. And so um, it seems to have a stem characteristic to it, a marker for a stem cell uh, with the salic acid added. So that that is an indicator right there that it could be a subtype marker. Um, so what we noticed about this, as I said, was that it picked up um, a different group of cancers, some overlapping, but some different than the ones that were elevating CA199. So really the question at that point became, um, is there a difference between the cancers that are elevating STRA versus those that are CA199? Uh, and can they be used in combination, firstly, to detect more cancers of any kind, secondly, to differentiate between two different subtypes of cancers? Uh, so uh, we began by looking at primary tumor tissue, and we stained the primary tissue for the presence of these glycans, comparing the morphologies of the cancer cells that express one or the other, and any other uh, information we could get on uh, molecular expression that could characterize the two types of tumors. And so you can see here, that there are some tumors that um, express primarily one or primarily the other or both or neither. So the orange staining is the C199, cyan is the STRA, and green is overlap. 
Um, and so we have the raw fluorescence data uh, followed by the overlay of the um, glycan on the H&E and then just a picture of the H&E next to, to it so you can see the cell morphology. Um, we found that over looking over many, many tumor samples in uh, multiple TMAs, this is our 2017 publication, um, there were morphological differences between the tumors that expressed primarily STRA versus those that were neither or C199. STRAs tended to be um, have a foamy large cytoplasm or to be um, poorly defined small uh, incipient glands or invasive glands. Um, the CN19-9s tended to be the well-differentiated epithelial ducts with structural, structurally intact functional glands. Um, the ones that were producing neither were a different stripe altogether, it seemed. Um, so we had strong morphological and some molecular co-staining with other uh, differentiation markers that we had two different subtypes. So um, what was important was that the plasma levels correlated with the primary tumor levels. We had about uh, 45 matched samples where we had blood samples with some matched tissue. So we could look at the correlation between the tissue levels in the primary tumor and the blood. And uh, you see just as these few examples here where uh, we had a tumor, uh, standard variety pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma with a highly fibrotic background in the upper left that stains with C199. And um, that in the blood on the right, where we have the x-axis, the C199 blood level, the y-axis, the STRA blood level, you can see that it uh, primarily is elevated in the blood in C199 only, but not STRA. And then um, in, the, in the image labeled number two, it's the opposite. It's more on the y-axis on that graph. And the one labeled number three is uh, elevated in both in the blood, meaning that the blood sample can be a good indicator of the primary tumor level, which means then that a blood test could be used to assess the, um, the staining or the tissue expression in the primary tumor. And we've also found this to be the case in cell lines and in Z xenographs, both aligned xenographs as well as patient-derived xenographs, where the level on the cell line uh, correlates with the level in the media or in the mouse serum. And that all is published in our 2019 pu uh, publication. Um, so the next step here was to define areas of application to pancreatic cancer, and we're looking at two different areas. One is uh, detection or diagnosis, and the other is treatment prediction. And so uh, detection diagnosis, detection, uh, what we mean by that is um, detecting pancreatic cancer when there's no evidence of any cancer or any disease. So this would be uh, outwardly healthy asymptomatic people, but possibly from a high-risk category. Uh, diagnosis means that there's um, some symptoms suggestive of a problem and for differentiating uh, benign disease from cancer. Uh, the prediction refers to somebody who has been diagnosed with pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma and is uh, selecting treatment route. <clears throat> So for the um, detection and diagnosis, the main goal here is to get a high specificity um, so that when it's used in practice, the number of false positives are greatly minimized so re to reduce the extra burden on um, follow-up testing. But then at the same time, we want a high enough sensitivity so that we're detecting enough of the cancers to make it worth um, applying to to the population who's targeted. Um, CA199 can be a very highly specific test 
at high cutoffs. But the problem there is that the sensitivity is so low at high cutoffs. So when you raise the threshold to give you a 95% specificity and a background of uh, potentially confounding diseases like pancreatitis and others, the sensitivity, the, the true positive rate is only about 20 to 30%. Uh, so we wanted to get a high specificity and improve the sensitivity um, to somewhere above 50 or 60 percent. Um, so a combination of the two, STRA and C99, could potentially achieve that because, as I showed in the tissue sections and in some of the blood, the STRA is elevated in a complementary way to the CA199. Um, and so this could be used, as I said, for differential diagnosis or for surveillance amongst high-risk people where the prevalence is high enough to make it worthwhile. Now, for prediction, this would be applied to patients considering the way we've seen it based on our data so far. Um, they're, pre they're considering um, chemotherapy, and we've found that uh, the STRA positive tumors are resistant to standard chemotherapy. All right, so beginning with slide 13 now. So our next step was to begin the panel development and blinded validation for the uh, goal of improving the sensitivity of detection using high specificity thresholds. This is a set of samples that we uh, published in our 2019 publication. Um, these are uh, samples that were collected from three different institutions uh, comprising uh, ductal adenocarcinoma and controls that were made up of healthy individuals as well as a wide variety of benign conditions of the pancreas. Now, when we run the STRA blood test, it's a sandwich immunoassay, and we run the sandwich immunoassay detecting the STRA glycan on a capture antibody. We have three different capture antibodies that we use as the base capture, and then we detect the STRA glycan on each of those three capture antibodies. So one of the capture antibodies is the CA199 antigen itself, so it's a sandwich immunoassay in which we capture CA199 and detect STRA. The others are mucins that carry the glycan, MUC5AC and MUC16, so it's three versions. We do it this way because um, we do not have a good way of capturing STRA itself. Um, these three, as individual markers, are each good individual markers, especially the one in red, the CA199 STRA. Um, and as an individual marker, it is slightly better than C199. The key with um, all three of these, if you look at panel B now, is that they're complementary. And what we have here is in the x-axis is standard C199, and the y-axis is the STRA antigen for each of these three immunoassays, and you'll see that they are anti-correlated. And, and this is good because we... The red dots are cancer, black are the controls. So you can see there are cancers that are elevated in one or the other. And it's that, it's that complementary nature that means that if you bring them together, you're going to detect a higher number of cancers than either one alone. So you don't want them correlated because then they would just detect the same cancer. So this is, this is what we wanted to see. And now by setting the proper thresholds for each of those markers, you can um, then detect a higher percentage of patients. And in panel C, that's what we did. This is the same type of graph where the um, columns are patients, the rows are the markers, top row is CA199. Then we have um, the CA199 STRA immunoassay and then the MUC5AC STRA immunoassay. And you can see that the, the Second and third rows uh, pick up some patients. The yellow means above threshold. The red is below. And then the, the gray and blue row indicates um, whether a patient was elevated in any one of the three. So if a patient is elevated in any one, 
or two or three of the three markers, it's classified as a case and gray is, is not. And you can see that um, there's a good sensitivity uh, with the high specificity, only two false positives in the panel. Uh, for comparison, C199 alone um, did not do nearly as well at a similar specificity. So um, in the panel training set, next slide, you'll see that um, you'll see here that we improved the sensitivity to 63% over 47. This is a really good performance actually for CA199. I think it just depends from set to set. This was a set that uh, had better than some other sets that so would be more like 30%, as I said. Um, and so this was setting our thresholds and, and combination rules that we were using. The, then what we did was we had another set that was blinded and we ran our assays and made calls without knowing anything about the samples. So we sent back to the statistician, we think this is cancer, we think this is control. This is the rigorous way to do the validation. And then when we did that, you'll see um, in, the, in the next panel there that the performance of the blinded calls without any, uh, this is using the thresholds derived from the training set, making blinded calls, we had a statistically significant improvement in sensitivity over C199 alone. This is the most rigorous validation that can be done. And it's the first time that there's been this kind of validation of an improvement upon CA199. Anytime any suggestion in the literature has been made of improvement over C199, it's using unblinded data, um, data uh, analysis after the fact. Uh, this is using upfront uh, predefined thresholds and classification rules with statistically significant improvement. This is in our 2019 publication. We followed this up on several sets. Now we've seen this in, in many different sets of samples. So um, we're quite confident that we have a combination test that improves upon C199. So we think that we're getting to the level where we could justify uh, a sur surveillance amongst high-risk people where we would have high specificity and enough sensitivity to uh, make it worth running the test and then the test would um, lead to further up study, further on uh, studies using imaging. So um, I'd like to tell you about um, predicting chemotherapy responsiveness using a pretreatment blood test. So it's, it's encouraging that um, using chemotherapy, the modern chemotherapies, there, there are some responses um, we see about 30 to 40 percent of patients showing good response, especially when the cancer is localized, um, and they seem to have um, extended life. But there's an also another large group of patients that um, don't respond at all and um, have rapid relapse. This This is true for chemotherapy be applied uh, prior to surgery as well as after surgery. If we had a test that could identify the chemo-resistant patients ahead of time, um, it would allow us to study alternative treatments, develop uh, patient-specific treatment plans, uh, guide clinical trials, also in model systems and other um, experimental therapeutics provide us a way to um, understand the biology of the uh, unresponsive cancers that subtype better. So um, we found here in another study in which we were using samples that were collected prior to um, the beginning of neoadjuvant therapy that we saw as individual markers, we saw elevations in cancer versus control. But um, the key was that we saw um, more positives 
in the patients that were non-responsive or had rapid relapse following chemotherapy compared to those that did not. And so you see here that um, the using the the STRA markers, this the three versions of STRA, we see a high elevation in two or three markers in 50%, 50 to 60% of the patients that had rapid relapse and in a very low percentage of the patients that had um, long responses. So those are the um, controls on the right. Very few of them, only one or two, are elevated in more than one marker. But on the patients on the left, where they had a rapid relapse, so they're non-responsive, um, in the combined sets, about half of those patients were elevated in two of the tests. So um, this is also shown in analysis of survival curves, where if they're positive in the panel, so that's the patients that were blue in the, um, the bottom line, the panel call was positive. We see um, they have a very, there's a, a line that has rapid uh, decline, so very short survival versus the red line. Those are panel negative. They had longer survival. This is in two independent sets. Now, uh, C199 does not provide predictive uh, value. This is well known from many studies. Um, we're just using this as a comparison. CA199 is more of a tumor burden indicator. Um, so it has some relationship with prognosis, but it doesn't tell you anything about differences in subtype of cancer. So it doesn't have any treatment prediction value, just some prognosis value. STRA, in contrast, um, has value for differentiating a different subtype of cancer that is more resistant to chemotherapy. Um, the blood data I'm showing you here uh, is backed up by a lot of data in cell culture models where we show cell culture models that are uh, resistant to chemotherapy are high in the STRA. And um, this is what we see right here is that in a panel of 27 cell lines, um, we have them divided by STRA or C199 or neither, the uh, cell lines that are with the cyan bars are STRA positive cell lines. We have some that are both and then the orange are S uh, C199. Overall, the studies that we've done in many different drug combinations, we see the IC50s or the uh, resistance is higher in um, multiple different drug combinations, including fulfirinox, gemcitabine, others, compared to the cell lines that are either positive in uh, C99 or neither glycan. So um, currently in these two areas, we're working on clinical assay development. Um, we've been able to port this to a clinical assay with standard curves and controls. Um, further testing and blinded sets. We also are working with pre-diagnostic sets. That means uh, serum samples that were collected prior to any symptoms, um, any onset of symptoms. This would be replicating the situation where uh, we would be uh, doing surveillance amongst high-risk people. Um, we also, um, on the prediction side, we're doing further testing of the lead panels um, and we're also using this in tissue staining to uh, see if the tissue staining assays are complementary to the blood assays for treatment prediction. So with that, I'd like to thank um, the lab members. This was led by Dr. Jungfeng Gao and others in the lab who've done excellent work. And um, my wonderful clinical collaborators, Dr. Brand at Pittsburgh, Dr. Singhi, um, many others. Um, Doctors uh, Evans and Tsai at uh, Medical College Wisconsin, and uh, all the others that you see here, and funding through the NCI primarily, and other groups. So um, I thank you for listening, and I'd be happy to take any questions. 
Thank you, Dr. Hopp, for that outstanding presentation. We will now move to the live Q&A portion of this presentation. And as a reminder, please submit your questions via the Q&A box. Dr. Hopp, where do you foresee the future clinical use of biomarkers in screening asymptomatic patients with high risk of pancreatic cancer? <clears throat> the, um... Screening of patients um, at high risk is already taking place to some degree amongst uh, people with um, first-degree relatives, so more than one first-degree relative, uh, but especially those with uh, genetics that um, put them in an even higher risk group. Um, it's not exactly clear how the genetic markers line up with the family history, um, having both genetics and family history put, certainly puts someone at a higher risk. So, um, but in addition to people at a hereditary risk, there's also uh, clinical factors that puts somebody at a higher risk. Um, so as with many different cancers, obesity, smoking, um, but uh, chronic pancreatitis puts someone at a higher risk. Um, another clinical category is uh, new onset diabetes. So it turns out that patients that have had uh, sudden onset adult diabetes um, within the past two years have an increased risk. And um, the prevalence of uh, pancreatic cancer could be as high as 0.5 to 0.8 percent in that category. Um, the prevalence of cancer amongst people with strong family history is anywhere from 1 to 2 percent. And so these, these categories are, are high enough prevalence where um, it would be justified. It's already been recommended by a task force studying these issues. Um, where a, a combination of a blood test with follow-up imaging um, could be effective and also uh, justifiable from a healthcare cost perspective. Uh, so we, we think, based on our modeling, that if we have a test that gives 95 plus percent specificity with 60 percent, 60 percent plus sensitivity, um, followed up by, that would, that would enrich the prevalence to about 10% or more, which means that um, in imaging tests, one out of 10 would probably be positive in cancer, and that would justify the use of imaging. Um, so we see it being used um, in one of these clinical or family history categories. Um, some of them have yet to be defined very well. But uh, there are enough high-risk categories uh, where prevalence is anywhere between 0.5 to 1.5%, where a test that um, with, with similar performance to what we have could be justified. So um, the first goal is to show that we can get that performance in patients who do not yet have symptoms. So all of our data so far uh, the patients have symptoms. They probably have a slightly higher elevation than people who would be one to two years away from developing symptoms. So we need to get that data, and we we have some samples um, addressing that question. So we're hoping to get that data soon. Thank you so much, Dr. Hobb, and thank you to our audience for these great questions coming in. Dr. Hobb, how and when do you recommend and interpret the results of this biomarker? So at, at the moment, we think that this test will be useful anytime you would order a C199. So um, patient has uh, symptoms suggestive of a pancreatic problem, um, and you're very familiar with um, when to order a CA199 to rule out cancer or, or perhaps with very high elevation to uh, strongly suggest a diagnosis of cancer. So anytime 
or uh, people are uh, ordering C99 to monitor uh, reduction in levels or uh, re-elevation. Um, as I showed, it's complementary, meaning um, that some patients that would be low in C199 or fail to show an elevation um, would show an elevation in this one or in both. And so uh, anytime that you would order a C199 for um, a confirmation or ruling out diagnosis or monitoring, uh, you would order this one too. And the nice thing is it's only one additional test. So the cost is not going to be uh, very much higher than just CA-199. The interpretation, um, well, I will say though that in, in, in an additional area where it would be ordered would be, uh, we hope, in, um, in determining chemotherapy regimen, uh, whether it be standard chemotherapy or a trial or some alternate version where the patient's high in STRA would be uh, predicted to be resistant to first-line chemotherapy. Um, the interpretation is it is uh, much higher in adenocarcinoma compared to any other disease of the pancreas that we've looked at so far, possibly some mucinous tumors um, elevated as well. Um, uh, High-grade uh, IPMNs potentially elevated in some cases. We've seen a few neuroendocrine carcinomas elevated as well, but not enough of a high percentage that it would certainly indicate a, a neuroendocrine cancer. It's much more prevalent in adenocarcinoma. So I think I think it would be interpreted as strongly suggestive of adenocarcinoma, particularly at high levels of elevation. And um, it would be then suggestive of a treatment resistant version of adenocarcinoma. Thank you, Dr. Hobb. And we have time for one more question. Our next audience member asks actually a two part question. What are your thoughts about the current pancreatic cancer screening methods, for example, imaging and biopsy? And then what are the gaps in the current screening protocol? Um, well, imaging followed by biopsy um, is, seems to be useful when the prevalence is, is high enough. And it does seem to catch incipient cancer in some cases. And, and it seems um, justified in a strong family history setting. But I think um, if you were going to try to apply that type of protocol to uh, patients more at a clinical risk, like from um, chronic pancreatitis or new onset diabetes, I think the prevalence of disease in those categories would be too low to justify the cost of screening. See, because those the imaging is a lot more expensive than a blood test, so you you need to use it more sparingly. So I th I think um, currently uh, no one wants to make a diagnosis unless they have an imaging confirmation, and if possible, biopsy confirmation. A, a biopsy has uh, great challenges with the pancreas because of the difficulty in obtaining a good biopsy. Um, often the correct area is missed, and uh, even if cells are obtained. Uh, it can be inconclusive because of the quality of the sample. So, uh, and it can also induce a lot of, um, has risk of uh, side effects, um, introducing other problems, some morbidity, so, um, or seeding the tumor. So pancreatic biopsy is by no means a, a totally easy, foolproof, benign procedure. So the blood test really has huge, huge advantages over that. Um, so we, we hope that a good blood test being used in combination with imaging and or biopsy would be uh, a great improvement over just those other methods. And what was the other part? What are the gaps in the screening um, protocol? Um, I think I think the, the gap is uh, a good low cost blood test. Um, so that's where we're hoping to fill in that gap. 
um, because CA-199 is not good enough to be used in screening. So certainly a low-cost blood test used in combination with imaging biopsy um, is a huge gap. Um, and uh, just the fact that um, it seems like there are a subtype of adenocarcinomas that don't elevate any marker that we know of and that really seem to be a different subtype altogether. And so uh, developing some better understanding of um, all the subtypes of pancreatic adenocarcinoma is is a big uh, goal. We, we know for sure a couple of these subtypes. The STRA seems to be elevated more in one of them, and then the STRA, and there's a much work going on in other areas about subtypes. But it seems like there's um, uh, a group of cancers where it's very hard to understand exactly what the nature of that subtype is, and there's no good way to detect them. So I would say a low-cost blood test and just a better understanding of all of the subtypes of adenocarcinoma. Dr. Hobb, I want to thank you for your presentation today. Would you like to provide our audience with any closing remarks before we end today? Um, so just keep keep watch on what we're doing. Um, uh, this is really an up and coming biomarker, and um, I'm hopeful that uh, this will be uh, valuable for patients and doctors and, and help the field. So thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Brian Hobb, thank you again for your presentation and for your important research. And I want to thank our audience members for their outstanding questions today. We hope you found today's presentation to be informative and insightful. This presentation will be available on demand viewing. Don't miss out on the other valuable presentations on our agenda and visit the agenda tab in the auditorium for a full listing. Thank you again for your participation. Until next time, take care. Be safe. Bye-bye. Okay.